Minister, good afternoon to you. We understand that you've just had a briefing with the uh, management. Excuse me, with the management um, here at Coburg. Um, let's start with the reason for your for your visit today, and then also what what you can share with us um, on your visit so far. No, oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you know that uh, we have made it. Uh, we have normalised visiting uh, power stations just to get an appreciation of the performance of uh, the various units at the individual power stations and see what uh, kind of uh, interventions are required to be able to help management in the, the execution of their function to the extent that uh, such assistance uh, will be required from the ministry. So we're here at Quebec uh, for, for the same reason and you know that uh, we had uh, significant challenges towards uh, the tail end of last year. We had uh, issues uh, retaining uh, Unit 1 uh, into service uh, as part of uh, the extension of life. Uh, uh, there are licensing requirements that had to be satisfied and we're out uh, by about 158 days. We had uh, promised the country that we we're going to retain Unit 1 uh, by July of last year. We only retained it in December and it also had uh, a spillover effects with regards to Unit 2. So first was to confirm that uh, uh, Unit 1 now is uh, operating at 100% uh, uh, capacity and as I've mentioned before that uh, as a result of the refurbishment and the extension of life we were able to get an additional 27 megawatts over and above what was uh, the initial uh, license. So, so that's a, that's a positive. Uh, and uh, the second thing we wanted to I wanted to pick up was uh, uh, whether there are lessons that uh, can be drawn from uh, uh, Unit One that uh, can be used. Uh, in uh, retaining Unit 2 on time uh, and the comfort I got was that yes there were lessons that uh, were derived out of our experiences of uh, Unit 1 and the intention is that we don't want to have uh, uh, repeat uh, delays and I, I do have uh, absolute confidence in the presentation that uh, I've received that uh, we are highly unlikely going to um, experience uh, such delays. We only experience delays of about uh, 38 hours and that had to do with uh, the wind speed in this area. Uh, there are certain operating um, uh, parameters that are required when there's a uh, um, significant wind. Uh, there are operations that you can't perform. So we lost 31 hours, uh, but the team have uh, illustrated show now we are going to get that back. So we are on track of uh, re, um, getting this uh, unit uh, synchronized uh, by the 30th of uh, September of this year, getting that, that license, 980 megawatts. Then the third uh, uh, reason why I'm here is because, as you all know, that we are going into a new build program of 2,500 megawatts of uh, nuclear power. So I think the conversation here is just the state of, uh, of readiness. Of course, uh, DMRE is a procurer. The owner and operator of that uh, nuclear facility will be ESCOM. So ESCOM continues to be a major player on the generation side, including uh, on, on nuclear. And the conversation there is that uh, do we have uh, the capacity, the skills to help us to go into additional capacity? And the team gave me an assurance that they've been working on that, anticipating that sometime in the future we're going to go that route. Uh, I must say that I'm sufficiently satisfied with what the team has shared with me. Of course, uh, finalizing the, the procurement, um, uh, if you like, um, um, uh, uh, consideration, what is the architecture of that procurement? Uh, because as you will know that uh, ESCOM is not sitting with that um, amount of liquidity that is required to uh, have the, a build of that uh, magnitude. So they are working on that, uh, the team, DMRE, ESCOM, and our team to ensure that uh, when we go out for requests for proposals, we have clarified really what uh, the roles of the various players in the space. Of course, like I said, the ESCOM will be the owner and operator of this uh, of this new build. So yes, and then uh, there are about uh, three sites that had been identified, two of them here in Cape Town, one of them just across uh, uh, the, the, the facility at, um, at Quebec. Uh, it's uh, been earmarked for additional capacity for nuclear. Of course, we have to replenish, uh, if you like, the, the EIAs. There's a site also in the Eastern Cape that has been identified. So those are the issues that we are working on so that when we, we get to, uh, get to uh, complete the procurement event, all of the things are aligned and we are able to start with, uh, with the construction of that uh, build. Uh, so yes, I, like, uh, the long and short, uh, sufficiently satisfied that uh, Unit 2 is, uh, is on track um, and the lessons uh, drawn from Unit 1 are such that it's going to enable us uh, not to repeat uh, uh, similar mistakes. Hi, Minister Paul Vecchio, from Bloomberg. 
Um, when do you expect your unit to, to be fully refurbished and operational again? And then secondly, uh, uh, whilst uh, Kubrick's been held up as a model of one of the most reliable power stations, um, and should and its license is up for renewal, as, as you mentioned, I think it's next year. Um, have, you, have you looked at any contingencies, such as in the unlikely event the license or is delayed or not renewed? Well, well, two things. Uh, first is that you you are absolutely correct. I think there is. Uh, a number of uh, studies, about two of those studies that are still outstanding, that needs to be given to, to the regulator. And the point I was making here is that we need to ensure that we, we provide those uh, as soon as uh, as soon as uh, possible, because the expiry of uh, Unit One, the license, I think is uh, is July of this year, and then uh, Unit Two sometime uh, next year. So it's important that we are able to fulfill those. And one of the things that has been a major achievement is a separation of the licensing unit one and unit two uh, so that you are able to de-risk the project uh, if you like if there are issues on one unit it doesn't affect uh, the entire complex that is uh, that is Quebec uh, so yes and uh, to your first question uh, like I said we, the expectation is that uh, uh, by 30th of uh, September of uh, 22 this year we, we should be synchronizing um, uh, unit uh, unit two so that's the timeline that we, we have uh, uh, set for ourselves and like I said the team was taking me through relative to that timeline we think we, we're still on track uh, of course I mean you you can't anticipate if there are surprises events that are outside your control but we, we, re we remain uh, we remain uh, uh, in line with that uh, with that timeline like I said I mean it's about uh, 112 hours or so where we are out uh, but the team has illustrated how they'll draw that back 31 hours of those who are say as a result of wind speeds uh, that uh, uh, did not permit them to continue safely with uh, the work that is, uh, is required. So I'm, I'm confident about uh, our ability to meet the timelines. Minister, just a question. I think I've read that the International Atomic Energy Agency um, had a report out sometime last year um, on concerns around um, Kuburg. Um, can you just tell us um, whether some of those issues that have been highlighted there have been addressed, for example, maintenance of buildings, etc.? Uh, and, and how big a concern is that for you with um, South Africa's only nuclear power station? Well, first is that uh, the authority in the country is uh, our own nuclear regulator, and of course, they're, uh, working with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, so yes, I mean uh, there's a, a number of uh, events or activities that the uh, ESCOM needed to uh, satisfy, uh, and from uh, the best of my knowledge, uh, having received multiple um, uh, updates from the team, is that they were, f were ticking all of those boxes. Like I said, I think it's, uh, it's two reports that are outstanding, and that will be made available to to the regulator. And I really don't want to preempt the, the decision of the regulator. They are independent; they make their decisions uh, outside ESCOM. So. I think it's important that we give them the scope. All that will do is to make sure that uh, we satisfy the legislative requirements, the reports that are, are needed uh, so that they are able to make a, 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 an informed decision. Because the last thing you want is for people to suggest that uh, it's an arbitrary decision because if that's the case, uh, really you are degrading, if you like, the integrity and the authority of the regulator. So they are independent, they'll make their own decision. All that we can do is to furnish them with all the information that is required. They'll make that, uh, that determination. Just another question from my side, Minister. Sorry, guys. Um, we're also toggling now as a country between stage two and stage, stage three again. Um, this is obviously not an ideal situation, Minister. Um, where to from here with, okay. with, low, with the low trading, um, ongoing low trading? So, if you look at the ESCOM's um, summer plan, was to say that uh, the unplanned capacity loss rate, that is the rate at which the units are unreliable, failing on their own, the partial load losses, that is the unit not uh, approximating their design capacity. We're expecting that number to be about 14,500 megawatts. So simply meaning that we are going to be losing on average 14,500 megawatts. If you look at the trend line, uh, we have been uh, on average uh, below even 14,000 megawatts, uh, flitting with 12,000 in some instances uh, way below 12,000. Uh, and that's why and in that scenario they were suggesting that they anticipate that load shading 
will be about the uh, stage four. And uh, of course, we have surpassed that. Uh, like I said, we'll prove that. Uh, first is that that unplanned capacity loss factor is lower than, on average, the 4, 14,500 megawatts. It's about uh, 13,500 megawatts or so, 1,000 megawatts uh, 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 or, uh, in, the, in the positive. And then the, the second thing to note, the, like I said, I mean, uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, because some of these things are, are really transparent, that uh, there's less and less uh, reliance on, uh, on diesel. Uh, and re really, this is the true health of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the grid, uh, that they were placing less reliance on, on diesel. We are, uh, on many occasions, uh, morning peak, evening peak, we are not, uh, we are not running uh, our peaking um, uh, open cycle gas turbines, because it's expensive to run that. And with that, we still are oscillating between uh, stage one up to stage three uh, maximum. Um, and then we'll see that uh, when we go towards the end of uh, of this month of February, there's going to be a, a, a some degree of reduction on the plane maintenance because that's how it has been planned. If you look at plane maintenance, it's over uh, 8,000 megawatts. There's been average in there. So it should be coming down to about 6,500 or so. So that's uh, an additional 1,500 megawatts uh, to the grid. And this is on the back of the fact that uh, we have retained uh, a uh, unit five at uh, Kusile. Uh, and of course, I mean, what they were sharing with me is that uh, I just made the point unit two will come 980 megawatts or so by September. We know that unit four in uh, Midup is coming on stream uh, around uh, uh, April, May 800 uh, megawatts. And then we know that the uh, 800 megawatts of unit six is going to come uh, from Kusile towards uh, the end of, uh, of the year. So if you were to ask me, uh, for the year we're looking uh, good. I mean, from the relative position from where we, we were, I think we, we're looking in better shape than we thought, even ourselves. But still, we have load shift. So I think the, the intention on reducing the intensity, I think we're on track. The next uh, target now is to ensure that we're able to eliminate it completely. So once those units uh, come on stream and we get to be even more aggressive on new generation capacity from um, renewable energy players, of course, there the major bottleneck is transmission. I uh, will be making announcements on the transmission. I've been giving updates, but I'll be sharing with the country just firm proposals. So now we're going to expand the transmission to accommodate the uh, uh, renewable uh, generation capacity. That is new generation capacity. You will see that uh, I think the, the outlook looks good. But like I said, I mean, uh, we're sitting with load shedding now, and the intention is to ensure that it doesn't get uh, intensified, it doesn't get more aggressive. If anything, uh, it tapers where it is, and then uh, we're able to bring it down and ultimately uh, to eliminate it. There's also, Minister, the question about the decommissioning of this uh, very power station after a uh, last span of 50 years, and it's not going to be happening. So how far are you with the relicensing of the whole system? Yes, that's the point I was uh, sharing uh, earlier on. So the point uh, why we've been going through this exercise, took out Unit 1, did the kind of work that we're doing, is to satisfy the licensing condition for purposes of extension of life, for it to get another 20 years of life. And like I said, the, the people who make ultimately the final habitat is the regulator, so we've given them all the information, they've been following up all the steps that we've been making, and then they're the ones who will say, yes, we are going to get another extension of life. And we are now doing Unit 2. So what we have done is to separate this complex. So you don't see Unit 1 and Unit 2 as one, but as two separate units. Because if you don't get the, if you don't get the license on the one, it means that the, the entire complex is compromised. And that's why we've been working on that the extension of life. That's not uh, up to me to decide this for the regulator. I have no intention really of putting pressure on the regulator. The regulator is independent. The regulator will make that determination. But from the briefing we have been receiving here, ESCOM has done everything possible to uh, meet uh, those uh, requirements. We can only remain optimistic, uh, do our bit, and the regulator will uh, determine. And really, like I said, I, I really don't want to uh, see executive overreach. It's not my business uh, for me to determine is the uh, regulator is independent. And that's the strength of uh, the energy complex in the country, that the regulator is independent. Safety is uh, uh, foremost uh, in their consideration. Uh, the operations uh, of this uh, nuclear plant uh, at levels that are internationally acceptable is a primary consideration. They'll make that uh, determination and we'll wait to hear from them. Minister um, Kuberg, if I'm 
not mistaken, um, supplies some 1,800 plus um, megawatts to the national grid, if yes. I'm correct. Now, I hear what you're saying in terms of separating Unit 1 and Unit 2. What if, and I think that's where the contingency question comes in, what if the regulator decides that neither of these units can be extended for another 20 years? What happens then? Yes, but I'm preempting what the regulator might say, and that's why that I'm pulling back. Let the regulator make that determination and we'll deal with the situation at that point. So I, because you remember that uh, in order to affirm the independence of the regulator, we, we don't have to, uh, if you like, uh, postulate, uh, enter into uh, an area of uh, speculation. I think I'll be undermining their independence. I really don't want to do that. Otherwise I'll be eroding the integrity of the regulator. And someone from outside will say, oh, so this minister said that is going to happen. It's, it's indeed happening as if we are giving instructions on the back of everyone. No, we'll not do that. Let the regulator do their work and then if they make that determination, because that determination ultimately is in the interest of the country. And if his safety is uh, foremost and they don't see that uh, you have met the requirement, they'll make that determination. If they arrive at the determination that it's safe to operate, proceed, we will proceed, but I will not enter that. So I really want to respect them and, and wait to hear from them. Um, a follow-up question, you mentioned two reports the regulator is waiting for. Can you tell us what those reports are? Oh yes, I just forgot what those reports are. I can share, I can share with you what those, uh, those reports are, okay. uh, so that you have a full and, then, and your question is the state of the transmission grid. Have you received any briefing on, on the state of the transmission grid? Oh, that's the work that we are leading. Uh, as the ministry, remember that the president has a has assigned a minister in the presidency responsible for electricity to lead that effort. And leading that effort simply means that uh, working with ESCOM, ESCOM has got a, a transmission development plan that stretches over a period of 10 years. We will need to uh, expand the grid by about 14,000 kilometers. In the next three years, ESCOM has got financing in place to do 1,400 kilometers, but that's not sufficient. We need to be a bit more aggressive. So whatever interventions that they uh, will come up with, of course, working with ESCOM, is such that we're going to add on that the uh, capacity of ESCOM from a financing point of view, the speed of the, of the rollout, uh, like I said, we'll make those uh, announcements because transmission is uh, likely going to undermine our ability to have new generation capacity, especially from renewables, undermine our nationally determined contribution, the greening of uh, energy generation. For as long as you don't re uh, address uh, transmission, you are likely going to sit with a major problem, especially in the capes, uh, the Northern Cape, Eastern Cape, Western Cape, that's where in the coastlines of those capes we have uh, the best wind, sp wind speed in the northern cape we have the best irradiation level and those are the areas to geographies in the country where we've got limited uh, uh, capacity in relation to transmission in fact in the northern cape has been completely exhausted so the opportunities you have you can exploit them because of uh, transmission constraints and that's why we want to focus on that uh, uh, investment in transmission minister last one when are we gonna be rid of flute service oh, for that's, good. That's the point I was I was making. For uh, good. Give us some time. Oh no no I will, I will six I, months no I, I I I can uh, commit to an absolute target because if you like the, it's a it's a moving target. So all I'm saying is that there's new generation capacity that's coming from ESCOM for certain it's a 800 megawatts from Midu before by uh, uh, April May of this year. It's a it's a, a 800 megawatts from uh, Kusile um, uh, 6 uh, towards uh, the end of the I think uh, around September, October of this year. I said this 980 megawatts uh, coming from Unit 2 here in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Quebec. Uh, so essentially the, you can see that uh, you are talking about, uh, uh, if you like, 2,700 uh, megawatts that's going to come uh, uh, just this year alone. I've not accounted in that mix uh, what we're going to get from uh, 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 new generation capacity from private sector and um, the, 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 the advantages we're going to have from uh, the aggressive rollout of rooftop solar solutions because we are proposing additional uh, incentives, of course, it's for National Treasury to make that uh, determination. And as we add that capacity, then the economy will stand on its feet. As the economy stands on its feet, greater levels of investment, additional pressure onto the grid. So if you had to ask me, if we get uh, another 4,000 megawatts from where we are today, I think we'll be 
able to address load shedding. So I've accounted for 2,600 megawatts just from uh, uh, um, 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 uh, uh, ESCOM alone. So this, uh, we're searching for another 1,400 megawatts. And once we get there, I'm confident, once we resolve the transmission side, we think that there's about 2,300 uh, megawatts that we can unlock there. You will see that we'll see the back of this. But once we announce, get to procure it, uh, um, and once we have procured it, then I'll give you a date and say, or a time, by this time, we are confident that we have uh, resolved it. What I can say to you, I'm confident about our ability to at least uh, maintain it at these levels without going to higher levels of intensity and reducing it over a period of time. I'll come back in relation to when is it going to end. It's an important question, really, and uh, the public has been very patient. I do understand the frustration, anger, and grievance. We will resolve that. I will say that to the general public. The last thing I want to do is to stand before the nation and misrepresent my, myself because I know what the true facts are. I would want to tell you that it will end yesterday, but that's not the case. I really want to tell the South African public the honest truth so that people are able to have an appreciation and are able to plan uh, going ahead. Uh, uh, Minister, you. just sorry, sorry, Minister. for my side, I wanted to check, I mean, you know the position of the Western Cape when it comes to um, producing electricity or energy. So with the outstanding amount that you are talking about, like how much we need to ensure that we have enough on the grid or the capacity, don't you then think it would be important for all cities or municipalities to actually be afforded an opportunity of what the Western Cape wants to do to produce its own energy and to put it on the grid? Oh yes, we're supporting the efforts. We're supporting the efforts. I mean, I'm on record the work that the the Cape Town municipality is doing, we, we're supporting them. The work that the uh, Tswani wants to do on uh, refurbishing the two power stations, Pretoria West and Rayval, we, we are supporting them. The work that the uh, City Power is, uh, is doing in uh, Johannesburg, we are supporting them. The work that Ekuruleni is doing for procuring from independent uh, power producers, we are supporting them. So I absolutely agree with you. I mean, it's the whole of government approach. Uh, we are searching for the megawatts, whoever can contribute. I mean, as a, an illustration, we're working with the Buffalo Municipality, Mayor Faku there, and some of the independent power producers. We think that uh, we can have a solution that is bespoke to supporting the automotive sector in that area. Uh, working with Nelson Mandela, there's a 40 megawatt uh, a unit, uh, a, a generating unit that was decommissioning. We decommissioned, we are revitalizing it also to support the, the automotive sector in that area because in their calculation, Buffalo and Nelson Mandela, that's the biggest contributor to the economy of those spaces. So we're working with everyone. So when I get to account, I'll account for all those megawatts. So I'm not suggesting in any way that the answers are going to come from ESCOM, are going to come from everyone across the board, including the private sector. So yes, the answer is that we'll be working with everyone. So sorry, Minister, sorry, I, you know, because I don't know where the meeting really was, but um, at the risk of repeating yourself, I apologize for that. But look, looking at um, Kuguk specifically, um, obviously there's been a delay in the seismic survey, um, and now it's kind of a race against time to get the license approval from the, um, um, from the nuclear um, regulator. Has there been, um, or, uh, firstly, um, could you please kind of discuss what the conversations are with regards to the delay, but also has the government taken into consideration the fact that these two units could not get approval in, in, in the future and, and have we kind of prepared for that situation as well? Oh yes, I answered that and made the point. That's one of the of the studies, the seismic uh, survey studies. Uh, the Council of Geoscience uh, is helping uh, is helping Quebec to do that. Uh, we are confident that we should be able to meet the timelines to give the regulator so that the regulator can arrive at uh, uh, its uh, own uh, independent decision. And of course, I mean, like the point I was making earlier, when I don't want to preempt what the regulator will say, I think it's independent. All that we can do is to be optimistic that uh, the licensing will will uh, happen, the extension of life. If it doesn't, of course, uh, will, uh, there's contingency measures that will put into place. Of course, if it doesn't, it means that you are losing uh, close to what 1,960 or so megawatts uh, from the in total. So, and that's why there's been a separation of the license unit one, unit two, so that you don't deal with this as one composite complex, but unit one separately from unit two. So that's the part of the risking, if you like, uh, the possibility of uh, of the license not being extended. But we leave that to the regulator. The regulator will make that determination. We don't want to enter into that uh, into that domain.
Thank you very much for this. Just one quick last question. Sorry, I was disappointed. The Department and Ministry of Minerals uh, Public Enterprise due to be uh, wind up business by 1st of April. Eskom, will it go to Department of Mineral Resources or come to you? Oh, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's the President and the Seventh Administration to, okay. to make that uh, determination. And I also don't know who will be the Minister. <laughs> okay. Yes, okay. Thank, thank you. you so thank, much. You. thank you very much.